The Giro d'Italia, the Italian Grand Tour, one of the most historic, beautiful and also brutal races on the calendar. As a cycling fan, I feel incredibly lucky to be able to watch the riders duke it out on the mountains and roads of Italy. But what we don't see when we're watching the riders on our TV screens is how they recover from each stage, how they rest up and get ready for the following day's riding. However, in this video, we're gonna look at just that because thanks to Whoop, we are very lucky to have the strain and recovery data from World Tour Squad EF Education Nippo. And I've been allowed to share it all with you. The 2021 Giro is 3,479 kilometers long with 47,000 meters of elevation gain. That's over five times up Mount Everest and about the same as riding from the Pacific to the Atlantic coast of the US in three weeks. So of course, it's a challenge. I remember the Giro to be pretty brutal, if I'm honest. Now, I know the stages look tough, they look long, they're hard, plenty of elevation. That is just part of it though, because the weather at the same time is so atrocious at times if you catch it wrong at that time of year, especially up in those high mountains. I think if you ask any rider that's done the Giro, they will pinpoint one or two days where they've been absolutely freezing. And that takes a big toll on your body, as well as the transfers as well. They are long days at the Giro. Aside from the racing, I remember getting up 6 or 7 a.m. You get to the stage, you have a long transfer in the bus, you do the stage, you'd be having your dinner, your meal on the bus, and then you'd be getting to the hotel late, going through your massage and getting into your hotel room even. And I remember some days I wouldn't be getting to sleep until 1 or 2 a.m. So really long days, which on their own are tough, but back to back over three weeks, it's pretty brutal and all that's before you even factor in you know the pressure of the race tactics thinking about the stresses in the first week when everyone's so nervous and you have that extra kind of mental energy you have to deal with in your head to avoid those crashes and keep yourself in the right position look after your teammates so it really is quite a massive assault in your body and i remember i'm not kind of glorifying this but i didn't feel recovered until after christmas after the giro i really just didn't feel myself i probably had one race day one or two race days, one stage race, I think in August, where I kind of felt decent. Aside from that, I just felt like I was battling with fatigue for the rest of the year. So if it all adds up and you really push yourself beyond your limits like most people do in a Grand Tour, especially I think for larger riders because those mountains take a bigger toll, it can really, really exhaust you. One way to manage the stresses and strains of such an assault on your body and navigate through that exhaustion in a slightly better way is through wearable tech. Now, Whoop is one such option, a wearable band which allows you to track things such as resting heart rate, your total sleep time, HRV, and also your daily strain levels. Now, they work with the riders and performance team at EF Education Nippo to help them manage their effort throughout the Giro d'Italia. So I was really interested to catch up with Peter Shep, EF's head of performance, to find out just how the team uses all this data to make decisions both before and during the race. How do you actually examine a rider's data leading into the Giro and also throughout it? Yeah, using the Whoop after weeks and months, um, you got those personal, let's say, unique benchmarks from the riders. So pre-race, you'd like to see fresh guys and at the start that they recovered well. Um, so what you'd like to see is a, a really high HRV pre-start and a low less resting heart rate. That's the cross relation you'd like to see from those numbers. And then they're ready to go. How do you strain and recovery scores to assess riders mid-race? And does this factor into the tactics on the day? Well, the strains is scaled up to uh, 21, um, which is based on personal data. So the intensive rides, um, like races, you'll see them between 18 and 21. So what you would expect is uh, a bit lower recovery number the next day after, let's say, uh, a 2021 um, strain from the race, um, which is, of course, totally uh, acceptable because um, if you do that in training, in, if you face a, a 20.5 or 21 strain, you would say, take an easy day tomorrow. So it's, it's, it's logical that you see some lower recovery numbers there. Um, but that's the same for every rider, so that's not a big deal. 
So the strain and recovery data collected from the riders provides some really helpful insight to the squad's performance team. But let's take a closer look at that data ourselves, shall we? And we are very fortunate to have British rider Simon Carr's data from the first 10 stages, fully disclosed and total permission for us to have a nosy through. Now, of course, this is just the first 10 stages and the race hasn't finished yet, but do stay tuned to the Racing News Show and GCN Show, where we'll give you further updates on Simon's progress. Starting off, it looks like Simon is a great sleeper, managing seven hours per night in the build-up to the Giro d'Italia on average, that is. That's 30 minutes up on all of his teammates. And in the Giro's opening week, he manages 7.3 hours per night average, which is pretty good, really. But after that Giro's opening stage, the prologue, which was 8.6 kilometers, he had an absolute howl of a night, only sleeping 5.7 hours, which was related in his lowest recovery score the following morning of 15. So what happened? Why was Simon kept awake after the prologue? Let's find out, shall we? And I also want to find out where he gets his good sleeping talents from. Uh, I think I'm such a good sleeper because it is something I'm actually work on and um, specifically since I got the whoop that's made me more aware of my sleep and um, yeah developed some strategies to get better sleep like reading before bed um, having a hot shower normally helps as well and um, yeah just being in a dark room earplugs um, so yeah I've got pretty um, not obsessed about it, but it definitely helps a lot. I've got pretty well of sleeping at the Giro. Uh, the one thing that really helps with that is bringing my own pillow and that just makes it feel more like home, even with the change of hotel. Um, and yeah, just getting the same routine every night. So even if you're in a different bed every night, you have the same routine and try and keep as many things the same as possible. So, um, I've actually uh, been coping pretty well with the, the changing. I think the, the biggest thing of that was having the, the time trial relatively late in the day and also having caffeine before the time trial, um, which I respond quite, um, quite a lot to. And that really meant that I struggled to get to sleep after that first stage. And I was also wondering, because having such a bad night's sleep and poor recovery score so early in the Giro d'Italia, would that have set alarm bells off to EF's performance team? So after that prologue, Simon had quite poor sleep really and also a poor recovery score. Did this set off any alarm bells to you and the rest of the performance team? Like there's a difference in um, close to getting sick or not at top level uh, fitness, let's say. So. Um, the key thing um, to go through a Grand Tour is keep the guys healthy. So the doctors and the trainers are on top of the WHOOP data, um, primarily to check if they're still healthy enough to go on. And then the second thing could be um, if there's some interesting numbers as input for the DS for the coming days. But primarily it's about uh, keeping the guys healthy and to check that. Simon's average HRV before the Giro d'Italia was 39. Remember, HRV is the variation in time between your heartbeats. Higher HRV, that's a good sign your body is ready to perform, lower a sign of fatigue. Now, Simon's HRV dropped quite considerably actually after the first five stages, down from 39 to 25. And five stages doesn't sound like much, but I can tell you that the fatigue in a Grand Tour hits quickly. And I wanted to find out from Peter if this was something he was expecting to see in Simon's data, especially considering that this was his first Grand Tour. Did you expect Simon's HRV to drop so early in the race? So I was looking through his data and it looked like he had an average around 39 pre-race. Um, and kind of by stage five, he was already down to 25. Is that what you're expecting? With the WHOOP data, we're talking about unique numbers. So the benchmarks are set based on the historical data from the rider himself. So um, the 39 you're talking about, that's basically the his benchmark. So everything above the benchmark is uh, kind of positive. And of course, the higher the better, but the benchmark is, is, is pretty much our guide uh, to track how he's going. 
On to the racing though, and Simon has already put down some standout performances at this year's Giro d'Italia, particularly stage nine. That gravel finish to Rocca de Cambio, which saw Egan Bernal clinch the pink jersey for the first time and really put down a solid display on the bike. But that stage started in blistering fashion. There was attacks going left, right and center with no control in the bunch, no breakaway managing to stay away for too long and really just general chaos in the peloton. It's a stage that I would have feared as a rider. I would have been suffering at the back of the peloton, hanging on while those attacks went up the climb without any control. It really is so, so difficult. But Simon rose to the fore and he established a breakaway of 17 riders, attacking on his own actually at one point. So it really was a big performance in his first Grand Tour. You can see how tough the stage was in Simon's strain score. 20.7 for the day, six points up from his average pre-race, three and a half thousand calories burnt, average heart rate of 137, with a max heart rate of 196, with some serious spikes in heart rate throughout the stage. I wanted to find out how Simon felt the morning of that stage and also post-race, because if we look at his data, he slept really well before the stage started, nine hours of sleep and also 88 on the recovery score. So he was obviously ready to go. I remember I did feel um, did feel good when I woke up and that obviously lined up with the whoop data. Um, but then once you get into the race, um, it's often a case of just um, giving it everything with the legs you have. So it's not really something that you can target specifically a stage if you happen to be feeling good. Following on from stage nine though, and you can see that Simon really felt that day, the fatigue is obvious. His recovery score was only 16 the following day and his resting heart rate was elevated above 50 for the first time. I actually recovered really well after stage nine. Uh, I think my, my recovery score was really high after that stage. And I often find that after a hard day, I actually sometimes recover better than the shorter, easier days just because if I'm tired, I get to sleep really easily and um, feel fresh the following day. Speaking of that resting heart rate, and it's clear to see how Simon's gradually increased over the first 10 stages in this graph, with a low of only 43 on the morning of stage two and a high of 51 on the morning of stage 10. And Peter provided some really interesting insight into how he expects resting heart rate to change over the entirety of a Grand Tour. How do you expect rest and heart rate to change over the three weeks for the entire team? Yeah, first of all, the WHOOP is helping to, to measure it uh, very accurately. So that's, um, that's the first thing we really like. Um, what we expect from a Grand Tour is that basically in part one, you will see them getting fatigued. Um, the, the, the heart rate will go up and then at, at a certain level, what you see is that during the race, um, they won't reach the maximum heart rate during the race, um, even if it's like really intense, they won't reach the usual numbers again from the max heart rate. So the whole uh, charts of the uh, heart rate will go down. So part two will show these numbers going down again. And then that's for sure not that they are fresh, they're still fatigued, but that's that's a natural system. Really? So the rest and heart rate starts to drop off again towards the end of the race? Yeah, but also the wow. maximum heart rate, so... Yeah, I remember that in the third week. You were looking down at your uh, head unit and you'd just see your heart rate would be where it would be on like an easy ride and you'd be going <laughs> as hard as you could. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's not all tough stages at the Giro though, because every now and again, a sprint stage comes along and a relatively easy sprint stage for that. A breakaway goes quickly and you can relax a bit in the bunch. Now stage five was just that for Simon. A stage one by Caleb Ewan. Now Simon's strain score on this stage was 18.1, which is a little bit down on his previous stages, which were kind of around a 20 mark. But that's still a tough day in the saddle, isn't it? And it's well up on his pre-race average. And I wanted to find out from Simon what it felt like taking on the fatigue of a Grand Tour for the first time. I think I've been quite lucky in that it doesn't actually feel that much different uh, racing a Grand Tour compared to other races I've done. Um, I think compared to a week-long race where often every day will be flat out in the Grand Tour, it seems that the bunch sort of auto-regulates in terms of there being 
some slightly easier stages um, and those are sort of rest days in inverted commas even if we still maybe have five hours on the bike it would just be relatively easy so um, yeah I'm not feeling too much fatigue so far so I hope that carries on. That is just a snapshot of the first 10 stages of the Giro d'Italia and we are really grateful to Simon, Whoop and EFA Education Nippo for providing us with this data sneak peek. But stay tuned to the Racing News Show and the GCN Show because we will provide further updates on Simon's progress in the third week and we wish him and the team the best of luck. But what did you think? Did you expect to see that in the data and do you think you managed to sleep as much as Simon in the Grand Tour? Let us know in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up. Thanks for watching all.